All right, let's kick things off. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us on this Friday for our uh, April CultureCon community webinar. So today we have Beth Ridley uh, here leading our webinar. Beth was actually a speaker at our mini CultureCon uh, Milwaukee back uh, in October, and will also be speaking at CultureCon 2020. Beth believes positive and inclusive workplace cultures inspire us to dream big, learn more, lean in, and become better. These values and behaviors fuel our success in good times and our strength in difficult times. Through her consulting firm, The Brimful Life, Beth helps organizations thrive in all times by putting people and culture first. Beth combines her 25 years of corporate leadership and management consulting experience with expertise in diversity and inclusion and positive psychology. Beth has some global experience and has lived all over the world. Uh, Beth has a BA in English literature from Virginia, an MA in international relations from Tufts, and an MBA from Columbia University. Beth lives a brimful life by spending time with her husband and three kids, and with running, speed skating, and watching cooking competition shows on TV, which is ironic because she really hates to cook. <laughs> so with that, I will turn it over to Beth. Beth, thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much, Zach. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and nice to virtually meet everyone. Um, you know, I just wanna say when Zach and I talked about this topic of diversity inclusion, it was like well before the coronavirus and it seemed like a, a great topic. It's, it's always a good time to talk about diversity inclusion at that time. A lot of companies were interested in building cultures of inclusion as a way to go from good to great. Um, then fast forward, we find ourselves in the middle of this pandemic. So my first reaction was, I don't even know if this topic is really that relevant anymore. Um, but I will say over the past four weeks, I have reached out and talked to at least 40 CEOs and leaders just because I really wanted to understand what are they learning about themselves uh, and their company cultures um, as they're leading through crisis. And an overall theme that I heard from the people that I talked to is that during crisis, it definitely highlights the strengths and weaknesses of leadership and culture. And those leaders who had always been investing in uh, building positive and inclusive cultures in their organizations felt that they were in a much stronger position uh, during challenging times. For the reason being that, you know, now is the time to really embrace and encourage diverse perspectives, different ideas, because companies have to get creative and innovative with how they're figuring out how to manage and ultimately thrive in this new normal. And leaders who had not invested in inclusive cultures are now saying that's one of the things that they want to start investing in going forward um, so that they can benefit from having more resiliency, um, more innovation as everybody's trying to figure out what, you know, what business looks like in this post pandemic future. Um, so I just wanted to say it turns out that it's always a good time to talk about diversity and inclusion, which is what we're going to talk about today. All right, so um, before we launch into the content, I wanted to share a little bit about me personally, since we're going to be spending about 50 minutes or so together. Um, and so Zach talked about my life like um, pre-pandemic. This is my personal life um, during pandemic. And so I think like many of you, I am trying to basically make lemonade out of lemons. And um, that means I'm learning new skills and getting creative with how I connect with people. So there's a picture of um, my dad who turned 85. We had a, a surprise birthday Zoom pop-up party for him with uh, the whole family. Um, he only lives 10 minutes away, but of course with social distancing, we couldn't gather in person. The picture in the middle is um, I do regular segments on leadership and culture for a local uh, TV show here in Milwaukee. And of course, I can't go into the studio now. So I am learning how to do live TV via Skype from my living room. And then the other picture is of my daughter. I've got three kids, but my daughter is 14 and she's got a huge head of hair and she likes it braided. And so usually I take her to get it done, but I can't do that. So I had to learn how to do box braids on YouTube and um, I did it. She was happy with it. It did take five hours. 
Um, so anyways, I, I hope I don't have to do that again. But, you know, like I said, just trying to make the most out of the situation that we all find ourselves in. Um, I just want to spend then a minute on um, highlighting a couple of things from my professional career, because I think it's important that you have appreciation for the um, perspective and lens that I bring to diversity and inclusion. So I just want to focus on like four key milestones in my career. Um, so the first was when I first started uh, early in my career, most of my work experience was uh, international. So um, I had different leadership roles for different um, companies in different cities, but I had the opportunity to um, live and work in uh, Tokyo and uh, London. Johannesburg, South Africa, and Bangkok. And what that experience taught me is that, um, you, you know, I, I, I became somewhat attuned to what makes all humans common, even despite some of our differences. Uh, when I moved back to the United States, I spent most of my time in New York City, and there I worked as a uh, management consultant for a large management consulting firm. So I had the chance to like drop into all sorts of different companies um, across a whole variety of industries. And through that experience, I really got to see some things that were really common about how to bring out the best in people despite the workplace, right? Despite the industry, despite the size or the type of company. Then um, I eventually moved to Milwaukee, which is where I'm from when my husband got a job here. And it turned out to be a great uh, time and place to have you know, kids and raise a family. But for most of my time here in Milwaukee, I um, worked at a large um, financial services company in a lot of different leadership roles. But uh, at one point, I led diversity inclusion for the company and really um, jump-started uh, the whole effort to build a culture of diversity and inclusion. But I also served in leadership, other leadership roles outside of diversity and inclusion. So I have a balance between being a DNI practitioner, but also being a leader who has to figure out how do you take these DNI concepts and best practices and integrate them into your day to day. And then finally, um, last year, I uh, started my own consulting practice that really combines all of my work experience and I really help. Uh, companies bring out the best in their leaders, teams, and organizations. Um, and I do everything from uh, executive coaching. I help, you know, improve dysfunctional teams, uh, full-blown uh, organizational culture transformation work, and of course, diversity and inclusion. But I will say that even if I'm not hired for a specific DNI engagement. To me, DNI is always woven into all of the work that I do because it is really at the end of the day about bringing out the best in people. Um, so I just wanna mention a little bit about my own um, philosophy around uh, company culture, culture transformation, because the webinar content is very much rooted in my, in my uh, philosophy and beliefs around culture. Um, so the first is that the culture of the organization really does start at the top. It takes its tone from leadership. I don't think, you know, that's revolutionary. I'm sure many of you agree with that. Um, but the second point is maybe where I start to differ a little bit. Um, I do not believe that you need big, huge grand strategies um, or to invest a lot of money in big initiatives in order to transform the culture of the organization um, to be more inclusive, for example. And this is a belief that I draw from my own experience having worked for a very large management consulting firm. And I do know that some consultants err on the side of um, big complex strategies that look amazing in PowerPoint. Uh, but then also having been a leader who has accountability for driving that strategy forward, I know how daunting and um, challenging it can be to have to take something else on, on on top of all of your daily responsibilities. So my approach really is to look for small ways that leaders can make big impact by influencing the things that they do on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. And so I do believe that transformational change around culture can come from doing small things that have a big impact as long as those things are done consistently and as long as there's alignment between the words that people say and their actions. 
So a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about in this webinar are really rooted in small things that you can do, but they can ultimately add up to um, transformational uh, impact. So the takeaways from this webinar, we're going to be, I'll be sharing three steps to make diversity a differentiator in meetings as a way to start to drive and build a comprehensive, inclusive culture across the organization is first, I just want to really simplify and demystify what it takes to drive a culture of inclusion. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about these micro moments, the small things, the day-to-day -day things that add up to the overall employee experience and how important and essential they are to driving a culture of inclusion. And then I want to make sure that I leave you with some really practical, actionable steps that you can apply at your work on Monday uh, in terms of DNI best practices and also um, inclusive communication skills that you can integrate into meetings. And these are um, actions that you can take, whether the meetings are in person or virtual as well. Okay, so a question for everyone before I dive into the content. I just wanna sort of gauge where folks are in your organizations on the DNI journey continuum. So I know these categories are very oversimplified, but I wanna just sort of get a sense. So if you could respond in the questions section, just type a one, two, or three depend, that best reflects where you think your organization is. If you're a one, that means you're starting about or thinking to start about how to drive a culture of inclusion in your organization, but maybe you haven't taken actions yet. Uh, type two, if you've taken some steps in terms of engaging leadership and employees around DNI conversations or maybe even training. And then type three, if you feel that you're far more advanced, you know, you're really, um, people in the organization have embraced a DNI mindset, or maybe you've got programs that are fully integrated into the operations of the business. So if folks could chime in, I at least want to get a gauge of, um, of the audience. So, um, I see some twos, some ones, some threes, some twos, 2.5, ones, two. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> I figured this is a mixed audience. Um, and so what I want to do is just first level set around terminology. So when I talk about diversity and inclusion, for me, diversity is the mix, the mix. And we'll talk about what we mean by that mix, but it could be anything from diversity that you can see in front of you, gender, age, ethnicity, to diversity that's hidden, life experiences, um, leadership style preferences. And inclusion is just how we get that mix to work well together. The two absolutely have to go hand in hand, diversity and inclusion, if companies are going to benefit from having a diverse workforce. Um, diversity without inclusion can lead to discord, misalignment, and in fact, when I work with dysfunctional teams, the primary root cause of dysfunction is that there is diversity without inclusion. So it's very important that the two go together. In fact, a lot of companies are now, instead of talking about their DNI initiatives, they're talking about their I and D initiatives, inclusion and diversity, just to underscore how important the inclusion piece is. Otherwise, you're not really benefiting from the, um, the value of having uh, diversity in your workforce. I won't drain this slide, um, but you know, I, I think we are all aware of there are very quantifiable benefits of having a diverse and inclusive uh, organizational culture. Um, that everything from you know, diverse and inclusive teams make better decisions. Um, companies with diverse and inclusive um, cultures uh, outperform from a financial standpoint, and certainly from a uh, talent recruiting and retention standpoint in the modern workplace, um, a diverse and inclusive workforce really, really matters uh, to employees. All right, so the concept of diversity inclusion, the mix, getting the mix to work well together is simple enough. There's ample research out there that supports the benefits of having a diverse and inclusive culture. So why is it that companies feel 
stuck, either just getting started or even making advancements. It really doesn't seem like it should be all that hard. Um, so some of the reasons that, um, you know, that, that leads clients to me when they're struggling with how to start with um, trying to build a more inclusive culture um, ranges from we don't have diversity in the organization. So how do we even begin if we don't really have much to work with? Sometimes I hear, well, we just don't have any budget or resources to put behind this. You know, we cannot afford a chief diversity and inclusion officer. We don't have money to put towards DNI initiatives. And what I often hear a lot from leaders is love, love it conceptually, um, but I am not equipped to lead in this space. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, say something wrong, offend people, and that is enough um, to, uh, you know, to be a barrier from getting started. So again, if you could um, share in the questions box, what are, what is a barrier that might be preventing your company from either getting started on the journey of building a culture of inclusion or um, advancing further than what you are. I'd like to hear what other people are experiencing as barriers to this. And I know some of you are, are consultants and not necessarily with the company, but maybe you could share some of the barriers that you hear from your clients as well. Yeah, I see lack of psychological safety is a big one and that can definitely challenge even getting started because obviously doing things to work on a culture of inclusion requires a certain degree of comfort, um, transparency, vulnerability. So if you don't even have that in the first place, uh, it can definitely be a, a barrier. Um, so let's see. Yeah, you're already great. Why do we have to create more problems? Yep. Um, don't want to uh, policy this and make it feel forced. Yes, it doesn't feel organic if it can feel too forced and top down. Leadership acting versus just saying it's important. Yes, misalignment between the words and um, and actions. People are just not even sure where to start exactly. That's why I want to demystify some of this and give you an easy place to start. Limited time and resources, great. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, very common themes uh, here in terms of the barriers and, and hopefully this webinar will help to chip away with some of that. All right, so let's start to um, chip away with some of those, I guess I would call them myths or misconceptions about what it really takes to get started with um, building a culture of inclusion. So the first one around, we don't have any diversity, um, or you know what, we're like good where we are, we're not necessarily seeking more diversity. Um, so I would say for organizations, honestly, if you have like more than one employee, you have diversity. I think a lot of times what intimidates people and becomes a barrier to moving forward is that they really only think of diversity in terms of superficial differences, right? Um, the things that you can see, uh, gender, um, race, uh, age, um, and um, visible diversity certainly matters. Um, but where the real benefit in terms of better decision making, better business outcomes really comes from thought diversity. Now, certainly the package that you come in uh, influences your life experiences, which influences your thinking. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think a lot of organizations really invest in getting under the covers to really understand what is that thought diversity and really tapping into it. So it, even for organizations who say, you know what, we're good, we're good with the diversity that you have, have you really mined the difference um, in um, thinking, analytical processes, um, leadership styles, life experiences that could be better harnessed to even make better decisions? So I would challenge organizations to really think beyond 
those primary dimensions of diversity and start to get into things that really um, influence thought, di thought diversity that you can bring forward into the organization to make um, better decision making. And in fact, a lot of um, potential clients might say, you know what, we, we don't have diversity, so should we start first with recruiting more diversity? And I say, no, 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 you do have diversity. Let's work with the diversity that you have and practice building a culture of inclusion around that first, because one of the worst things that you could do is start bringing in people who look different than what you have in the organization, and they feel alone. And if you don't have um, a stronger culture of inclusion, it may not go well. They may not feel welcomed or included. So there is always diversity. Start practicing building a culture of inclusion with what you have and mine deeper to get into and really extract the benefits of thought diversity. All right, another misconception. Um, we don't have money. We don't have any resources to put towards this. So why, where, how are we going to get started? So um, the single most important thing that you can do to build a culture of inclusion is to lead with the DNI mindset, to approach all of your work with a DNI mindset. And mindset is 100% absolutely free. Um, I just interviewed a senior leader at Baird, which is a, um, a global financial services company. And they said that they made a very conscious decision to not hire a chief diversity inclusion officer and to not invest in programs and initiatives because it needs to be everyone's accountability to approach their work with a DNI mindset. When everyone in your organization does that, you are really pretty much like the gold star of a diverse and inclusive organization, and you may not have had to pay a dime. Um, so what is a DNI mindset? It's really all about um, leading into this space with curiosity, so a genuine interest in learning about people and the courage to do so. So the courage to step outside of your comfort zone and challenge yourself so that you can broaden your appreciation and understanding of different perspectives and different life experiences. Um, and so that is where a lot of leaders are challenged, like, oh, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth. You know, what if I say something that's offended, uh, offensive? And I would just say to that that a DNI mindset is a learning journey. There is no finish line. You know, if you go back and, and see all the dimensions of diversity, how is anybody going to be an expert in all that? It's impossible. So there is no finish line. It's really a work in progress. Um, and in most cases, when leaders or individuals genuine, you know, approach developing their DNA mindset with, with um, genuine curiosity and genuine interest, and they're genuinely trying, even missteps are often applauded. Uh, because even when you misstep in, other, in front of other people in your organization, you are modeling and showing that it is okay to try and it is okay to make mistakes and learn from your mistakes. And that goes a long way to building an inclusive culture in your organization. Um, and so a lot of questions around, well, how do I start on building a DNI mindset? Do I need training? What should I do? And I say the best place to start is just in your own personal life. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean, if you pause to reflect on your own social networks, who do you hang out with? Who do you invite over to your house for dinner when we could? Um, or better, a better question is, who do you not invite to your home for dinner? Start thinking about the dimensions of diversity that are missing in your personal life. And that is usually a good indication of some implicit bias and maybe where you could challenge yourself to learn and grow a little bit more. So an example, I'll give you a personal example in full transparency. Um, at the risk of, you know, um, oversharing. Uh, yeah. So one of the dimensions of the diversity that is missing in my own personal life is um, around, you know, I don't really go out and become friends with people that have different political beliefs than me. So I knew that about myself and an opportunity came up a couple of years ago to participate in this program where basically they pair people um, uh, who are different. You have coffee with this person once a month for about six uh, months in order to get to know the person. So I raised my hand for the program and I said, I would like to be paired with someone that has 
different political beliefs than me, started meeting with this individual. I felt very awkward uh, initially because, well, what if we got into an argument? What if I said something that offended him? Um, but what we discovered is when we sort of put our politics aside, we got to just sort of know each other as people, as parents, as spouses. Um, we shared a lot of the same values and beliefs. We just sort of think that they should be addressed differently when it comes to policy. So long story short, I grew and learned a lot as a person through that interaction. It opened my mindset of people that have different po political beliefs are not evil. They just think differently, but there's always some common ground. Um, ended up becoming friends with, genuine friends with this person and had his uh, uh, wife and family over to our house for dinner. And we ended up, even though the program only lasted six months, um, spending time together for over two years. Um, so just short example of what it means to have a DNI mindset. So a question for you, if you wouldn't mind sharing uh, in the questions box, if you were to be honest with yourself and you look at your own personal social network, where do you see um, missing dimensions of diversity that could be an indication of where you could start in terms of cultivating your own DNI mindset? And again, look beyond superficial, consider things like um, differences in uh, professional status, edu um, economic status, maybe educational background. I'd like to hear from anyone if you care to um, be so bold and vulnerable. Oh, yeah. Different languages, for sure. I mean, that can definitely be challenging um, because it makes communication challenging as well. Uh, maybe if one more person wants to share, I'm just curious to know. Yeah, economic or political mindset, uh, totally. I think the sort of the political one is uh, common for a lot of people, particularly in this environment, but a great place to start. Okay. So the last thing myth I wanna bust um, and then get to the three tips on how you can use meetings to drive more in inclusive culture is around um, micro moments. So again, my philosophy, you don't need to spend a ton of money and have big, huge strategies. Um, and in fact, smaller steps that you can do is better because the best strategies are those that actually get implemented. And as it turns out, the things that employees really care about when they reflect on their overall employee experience in their companies are those everyday, day-to-day -day moments. So it could be the emails that they read. It could be the hallway conversations that they have, team meetings, one-on-ones. Those all add up to the employee experience. So therefore, if you want to drive a more inclusive culture, if you want to have a better workplace, positively impact those micro moments, those micro experiences, those day-to-day -day things like meetings, right? So meetings make up such a huge part of the um, employee experience. That's why I'm gonna focus on how to use meetings to drive an inclusive culture. But meetings is really small, it's that micro moment. So I wanna zoom out for a minute just so you can have a better appreciation of the important role that these micro moments um, play within an overall organizational culture transformation. So here is a highly simplified process map that um, I use with clients to help them walk through a culture transformation. And that could be trying to get their culture to be more innovative, or it could be trying to get their culture to be more inclusive, whatever the, the, the element of the culture needs to be transformed. But it starts first with strategy, right? So really, um, understanding how the values and the behaviors that you want to drive forward align with the overall vision and mission of the organization, right? So there, you're really making the business case for investing time and potentially resources in driving this, these behaviors forward. Then leaders really need to model the behaviors. Again, culture of the organization starts at the top and this is where the micro moments come in. So I really work with leaders to think about what does your average day look like? What are you doing? You're in meetings, you have one-on-ones, you're sending out emails. How do we make small changes to those things that you do so you're better reflecting and modeling and inclusive behaviors in those things that you're doing anyway? And that way they do them and they're able to do them consistently. So you link 
uh, the behaviors that you want to drive forward into, you integrate them into these micro moments. Uh, and then you encourage uh, other folks to um, embrace and demonstrate these behaviors as well, but uh, through um, positive feedback, recognition and rewards. And then ultimately you do wanna hold everyone accountable. So you have already made the business case that these behaviors are an integral part of business success when you did the strategy alignment. So it stands to reason that um, our hiring criteria are going to be based on these behaviors. Uh, we're gonna make sure that we give professional development around these behaviors so folks have no excuse for not being able to develop and demonstrate them. And then ultimately um, integrating uh, those behaviors in employee performance evaluation. Um, okay, so the steps that I wanna cover to um, foster a culture of inclusion using meetings as an example of the micro moment uh, that are so critical to changing and transforming the overall culture. Three steps that I'm gonna walk through. Uh, first, uncover and understand the differences. Uh, bridge across those differences with purpose and order and practice inclusive communication skills. Um, so these steps are probably most applicable to using in meetings where the same people meet regularly. So maybe a regular team meeting, a regular project meeting. Some of these steps is work that you wanna do prior to the meeting or outside of the regular meeting. And some of the steps you're gonna do on a regular basis inside the regular meeting, if that makes sense. And I'll explain uh, what I mean as we go through each of these steps. All right, so step one is uncover diversity. So again, I had mentioned that um, thought diversity is really um, rich, fertile ground for what companies should tap into to come up with, you know, develop better decisions and have better business outcomes. And meetings is all about the exchange of thoughts, right? So how do you better harness that diversity around thought? Um, so one simple way to do that is to use some assessments that really start to uncover differences in behavior, strengths, and styles among the folks that um, attend the meetings. So here are some very popular um, fee-based assessments that you can do. Um, they, they cost money, uh, but very highly regarded. I've used all of them, and uh, you know, it's um, you sort of start where there might be interest. Uh, so the DISC assessment, I'm sure a lot of people have used, um, is a way to assess uh, and test behavioral tendencies. There are strength finders, all about strengths and innate talents. Myers-Briggs, of course, everybody's heard of that, which gets to personality type. I actually really like this last one, CSI. It's a preferred style in approaching and addressing change. I think it's particularly um, appropriate in the modern workplace because the one thing that's constant these days is change. So it's kind of nice to uncover how people have, what their natural orientation around change is. Um, if uh, fee-based isn't the way you wanna go, here are two strength-based tests that I've used that are 100% free. So you just type in the, um, the company names, the email addresses there, and it's an online tool that everyone on your team can take. It takes about 10 minutes to do, you get the results right away. Um, and it's, it's a really good starting place in terms of identifying differences with strengths on your team. Okay, so step one is to, the second part of step one, I should say, is to, you've uncovered diversity, let's understand the diversity that you have better. And this is really all about dialogue. And so again, this is a step that you would wanna do before the meeting or outside of the meeting, it's not really part of the regular meeting. Um, but you basically want to just gain some insights and appreciation for how you could start to leverage this diversity for better decision making. <laughs> and um, there's really no science or magic to these questions. These are some questions that I've used. Um, doesn't matter what kind of questions you use to spark the dialogue. The, the magic was really in the dialogue itself. And I think just um, Spending the time to ask and uh, to ask questions and allow people to share really starts to plant the seed for an inclusive culture and bringing the team together in a way that they feel like they're collaborators uh, versus competitors, which can sometimes happen in team meetings. Now, 
Out of all the questions, I think the last question is most essential and should absolutely be asked and is rarely done so. So based on someone's individual unique personality type or style or whatever, what do you need to be your best as part of this team? Right? So rarely do we start to ask people, what do you need from others to contribute your best? And when you ask that question, you will get some responses that really spark, again, small things that everyone can do to make a big difference. So for example, when I asked this question recently, um, someone said something I, I, I just don't like being asked a question on the spot and being expected to come up with an answer. It just causes stress and anxiety for me. So I need either you know, to send the questions that you want to ask me in advance of the meeting or just know that I will not answer in the meeting. I'll come back with a thoughtful answer. So that was huge, believe it or not, because prior to having this conversation, the fact that people in the team would ask and turn to this person a question, she would feel stressed out and flounder. The people asking then got frustrated because she wasn't answering. It was all misunderstanding that if we really just took the time to appreciate what does each individual need to be their best, how can we all accommodate some of these things, meetings will go much better. Planting the seeds for a more inclusive culture. All right. I want to zip through these. So step two, now you've um, understood, uh, uncovered diversity. How do you start to bridge against, uh, bridge across diversity? Because again, diversity without inclusion is uh, discord and chaos. So um, you are going to do that by focusing on purpose and order. So by purpose, I mean you really want to align everybody, align all their differences to the higher cause, the bigger picture, to the, the shared goals that everybody has. So one thing that you can do prior or outside of the meeting is just have people share their whys um, that drive their motivation, that inspire them to show up every day, right? Um, that type of um, activity is great in terms of just getting insight into your colleagues, but also fostering some sense of emotional connection that everybody has to the shared goal. Um, and it really forms the glue that holds all these diverse personalities together. Then on a regular basis, always start the meeting with a connection to the purpose. So remind people why this meeting matters to the bigger picture, to the strategy, to the shared goals. I think far too often people launch into the meetings and they forget to ground people. They forget to, again, um, I, maybe like emphasize that glue that holds people together, right? Um, which is the shared purpose, the shared mission. And then don't be afraid in every single meeting to set some order, to establish order. Be clear on the expectations. Is this a meeting where you expect to make a decision or is this a meeting where you're only going to be talking and learning? Set house rules. It, all this just helps individuals moderate themselves better and better manage the things that they need to be their best. They can take some accountability for appreciating um, how to moderate their own style for the good of the team. So then the last step is to practice um, inclusive communication skills. There are a lot out there that you could throw in the mix, but I'm just gonna highlight four that are particularly uh, effective. And if you can uh, practice these skills more often than not, um, that again is really um, being consistent in terms of what it takes to cultivate an inclusive culture and transform the culture uh, via meetings. So the first one is to engage with genuine curiosity. Um, so again, really um, reflective of what it, a DNI mindset is all about and um, really being interested in listening to other perspectives. So you should always strive to each individual have equal parts talking and each equal parts listening in meetings. This is a big one that I think a lot of people don't appreciate. Seek to understand, not to agree. How often do you show up at meetings and by talking, your, your motivation really is to get people to agree with you. If you simply let that go, you will, the, the tone of the meeting really changes um, because there's always something to learn. Even if you don't go in the direction of what somebody is saying, there is value in hearing someone out and learning without feeling the pressure of having to agree or feeling the pressure of having to get people to agree with you. 
demonstrate patience and respect. So similarly, um, there is never one way to do something. Your ideas are just your ideas, does not mean that they're the best ideas. Uh, and so just to have respect and appreciation for uh, the diversity of, of, of thought out there. And then finally, also express empathy and acknowledgement. So um, the exchange of ideas is really an emotional experience. I think a lot of people underestimate that. And sometimes the most important thing you can do is allow someone to know you uh, appreciate their comments. You acknowledge um, how they're feeling. Oh, Jim, I appreciate that you're really, really passionate about this. Thank you for sharing. You know, those small little comments can go really a long way again, for increasing engagement and for the desire for people to want to participate and but also to afford courtesy to other people as well, because they feel respected themselves. If you feel respected, you're more likely to give respect to others. So before I jump to questions, I wanted to give you a, a case study. It's a nice, short, sweet little package case study that really brings all these elements that we just talked about together in one, one quick assignment that I did with, with the group. So, Here's the situation. It was a nonprofit board that I worked with um, comprised of 12 people. The board itself is very diverse in terms of ethnicity, age, gender, professional skill set. And this organization was really at a pivotal point uh, in their journey in the sense that they got a huge grant um, to grow the services that they provide. And uh, what they their growth was going to come from um, reaching out to communities of color and a younger demographic. So diversity and inclusion and leading with the DNI mindset was really integral to the success of this organization and their growth strategy. So the board knew that they had all the right ingredients, right? So DNI, they knew it was aligned to the strategy. They had a lot of diversity, at least visible diversity, but they couldn't pull it together. Their meetings were painful and unproductive oh my gosh, the meetings would go over sometimes by more than an hour with no decisions made. People were getting really frustrated, talking about how they wanted to drop off and leave the board. And it got to the point where there was so much discord and tension, like they didn't even want to be in the same room with one another. It was very dysfunctional. So what did we do? So we basically had a one day retreat and the first half of the day, the, the morning, was all spent on um, uncovering and understanding and appreciating differences. And the second half of the day was actually a board meeting. So they actually had agenda of business items, but we modeled inclusive behaviors that we learned in the morning during that meeting. So the morning comprised of everyone sharing their, why are you on the board? And believe it or not, the this board of the same people had been together for more than a decade and they never shared the why. Uh, so that was just a really good feel good moment for people to appreciate, you know what, despite our differences, we all um, are passionate about the work of this board and we all want to come together for the, the mission of the board to be successful. I had done some pre-interviews with everybody, so I knew the stumbling point in terms of the diversity that they couldn't bridge was around change style preferences. It was really coming to the surface because again, like I said, the organization was in a pivotal point in the sense that they were pivoting from business as usual to how do we put this huge grant that we got to the best use and take bigger and bolder steps. And so there were some folks who were um, not comfortable with taking bold steps uh, and they wanted more incremental change. And then there were other people who, you know, they were already thinking three, five years down the road and getting really frustrated with the folks who were taking incremental steps. So we spent some time sharing about that and people sort of self-identifying where they are in the change style continuum and what do they need from each other in order to um, be their best and to create the ideal board experience. Um, because after all, when you're on a board, it's volunteer. So if you're not feeling energized and enthusiastic and engaged in the, in the meetings, then people just decide, you know what, I wanna quit. So we all shared what is that ideal board experience and how can we all contribute to it? So that was the morning work. And then in the afternoon, like I said, we went through the business items, um, but we did all those steps that we talked about. So we set purpose and order. 
they in practice inclusive conversation and it was like magic i kid you not at the end of the meeting they made um, some critical decisions, but for the first time, they were able to better appreciate, you know what, we need those people who are thinking three to five years ahead to push us. But if we don't listen to those people who wanna take more incremental changes to dig, to force us to look deeper and to really develop the detail that's gonna support that bold move, we'd fail. So they really started to appreciate how these differences is not a source of frustration or disconnect, but they learned the ability through language and through just uncovering and appreciating the differences, how they can use those differences to ultimately have a better outcome. So they practiced that in that first meeting and then committed to, to doing all those things that we practice for every meeting. So what I created for them was just this cheat sheet of how to embrace inclusive um, behaviors in all of their meetings. So we reminded them of the many dimensions of diversity we documented what people said that they needed to feel um, energized and enthusiastic about being on the board and their board experience. We talked about all the important ingredients of, of a meeting, purpose and order. They added compassion. Uh, we added the behaviors and communication skills to uh, drive inclusion. We started with the four and they added two more. And we also identified the change style preferences as a reminder of people are coming to this meeting with different change style preferences, and that's a good thing. All right, so that was just a little case study, and I feel like I ran through some of this really fast, but I also wanted to save time for um, Q&A. So if you have questions, you can type them in and I shall address them. I think we've got maybe five minutes before the top of the hour, so I can take a couple questions. In August, I might see some of you in person, so um, we might be released from quarantine by the time that the um, CultureCon conference rescheduled. I think it's rescheduled. No, 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 it was not rescheduled. It was always August 6th through 7th um, in Madison, so I uh, maybe I'll get a chance to meet some of you in person. But thank you very much for hanging in and listening to the webinar. I really, really, really hope that you left with some, some good nuggets and um, more confidence in terms of uh, it's easy to make progress with diversity and inclusion. If you think about micro steps and the things, small things that you can do that have big impact. So thanks very much.